once again, happy Independence Day weekend to all of you. Tomorrow, of course, is the 4th of July. And uh, does that mean today's the 3rd? Didn't know I was so smart. Yeah. 10 years. Hallelujah. The 4th of July weekend brings, of course, a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Like, uh, it seems like when we moved here in uh, 1998, there was like maybe 8 to 10 fireworks tents. Now there's a tent on everybody's cul-de-sac. Wow. So it brings fireworks and it brings celebrations and it brings a little bit of break maybe and brings families around. But of course, it, it ought to bring a reminder. And uh, of course, I sent out an email on, on Friday uh, to you church just to kind of keep you up to date on some of the things and to remind you that we have a liberty in the Lord as much as we have, uh, we have a liberty in this country. And just getting back from Oaxaca and having a tremendous a mission trip with a team and things like that, but uh, there's something pretty special about coming back into your home country, named the United States of America. I was telling that to someone while we were going through customs, and and by the way, we went through customs in in it uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it was the easiest thing I ever did of all the countries that. So if you want to come back into the country. Grab Atlanta. No, I'm just joking. It was 10 o'clock at night, so that's what made it easy. But I was telling someone going through customs, I said, you know, I remember the first time I traveled internationally and came back to the country, uh, went to Japan and uh, came back and flew back on our own after going there uh, with the baseball team, with the Orioles and things like that. But we all came back into the country. And so we came back in, and, and my flight, of course, was into uh, Hawaii. I know you feel bad for me. Uh, sitting in the Honolulu airport for a while, but I remember going through the customs, grabbing luggage and then having to do that thing. And I remember the person looking at my passport and saying, welcome home, Mr. Brown. And I thought, what a neat thing. Welcome home. And uh, not all the agents say that anymore, but welcome home, meaning that, hey, this is your country. So I'm very thankful for this country, and I know all of you are as well. And when you start losing track of the beautiful country that you're in. Uh, just remi remember that uh, God's got you in a country. If you're born again today, there's already a country that you are waiting for. Abraham spoke of that country that he couldn't wait to see, and that country in the Lord Jesus Christ will one day be our eternity. Praise the Lord. If you have served in the military or you are currently serving, would you please stand so we can recognize you and thank you so much for serving in the military and continuing to serve in the military. Thank you so very, very much. Amen. Thank you all. I know none of you. Well, did any of you serve in the Revolutionary War? And some of the kids are going, Revolutionary War, do they, do they still teach that stuff in high school? Like, you know, like American history? I hope they do. They haven't rewritten anything, have they, Heather? <laughs> but praise the Lord for our country. In our study today in 1 Corinthians 2, before you go there, I'm going to get you off to Proverbs chapter number 1, which of course was the proverb of the day a couple weeks ago. When you hear our short little introduction this morning, you'll understand why God is going to lead us there in thanking uh, those that stood up. There was probably about a dozen of you or more. Um, very simply, serving in the armed forces and giving up your, basically your will for the will of the country. You take an oath to uh, protect this country, and you abide by that oath no matter what, and you say, I'm going to submit to your will. Commanders, leaders, those that are above you in rank, and you go to war, go to battle, one place or another, either domestic or foreign, and you serve that time, and you say, wow. It came and it went, and I'm thankful for that, and it was just my reasonable service. I just did what 
I know a lot of men and a lot of women that you recognize and say, thank you for your service. They say, I've done nothing more than what you have done, and thank you for honoring me by saying that, but it was an honor and a privilege to serve. I hear that from so many service men and women. I think about the context here in 1 Corinthians, and I think about what has happened here as we have, this is our fifth or sixth message getting into the end of chapter number two. And I think about that type of wisdom and thinking that I will submit to the armed forces leadership and I give up my life and my will and what I would do for whatever I'm told to do. Well, that's what happens when you come to Jesus Christ, is it not? You know where I'm going. You say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Jesus to save me, but I'm only going to be in for part of the deal. See, oftentimes people... They say, I want to be born again, I want salvation, I want to have my sins forgiven. I see the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus said that about having a relationship with God the Father through him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only one way. Paul writes, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he was telling them, it's not about all those other people and all the division issues that you have. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. He even said, is Christ divided? In chapter number one, was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of... It's about Jesus Christ. When you were born again, when you got saved, when you became the child of God, and and instantaneously your life has changed, the trajectory of your life has changed, and now you have eternity, you're forgiven and all that, you know what you signed up for? His will. His direction. His leadership. His wisdom. We spoke of it last week in the first chapter, excuse me, the first half of chapter two. We also spoke of it a few weeks back when we were in chapter number one. These first couple chapters really... At first we were saying, oh, I don't know why he would do this and why would he go after this? Well, he eventually is going to get to chapter 13, which is the theme song and the theme verse of our series in terms of what it says, love never fails, and his love permeating through that, the Lord's love for us. But when you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, his love was just, whew, you, you, you just, I'm forgiven. Why would you do that for me? 39 years this month, it'll be that I came to know Christ as my Savior, Lord, who changed my life, forgave me. And that work, finished work on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news according to the scriptures is his love never failing. As it says in the theme verse up there in chapter number 13, verse 8, charity never faileth. Charity is that G28 love. In your concordance. You figured it out yet, Steve? You got it now? You got your concordance out? Awesome. You grab your concordance, you look it up. It's G26. That agape love, that love that we are told by God in his scriptures is this benevolent love. It's this brotherly love. It's this love that comes from God that we can give to others. And it's found in the scriptures, like in places like John 15, 13. John 13, 35. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Charity never faileth. That's that kind of love that when you see the word love in your Bible, it doesn't always translate into that charity love. It's not always that same one in the root word. But in this context it is, and that's where it's the core root of our theme of this whole study on 1 Corinthians. This wisdom that comes from God, the wrestling match of man of uh, God's way of doing things and versus man's way of doing things. It's the spirit of this world versus the spirit of God. It's the constantly one way or the other. He says, if you've got prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. People and their ability to speak languages and have other tongues, if they have all of that, but that's all they've got, when they cease, they'll have nothing. As the scripture says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But see, charity never faileth. God's word tells me, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love, G26, one to another. 
John 5, 42 says, But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. That love of God is that charity, agape love. That's the love we're to have. Because as we, we've said a few times, your love is going to fail. But God's love in you, moved into someone else by the word and by the spirit of God, it won't fail. That kind of love is the love that the spirit of God gives you. That love that's part of the fruit of the spirit. The love that all of you desire in the body of Christ. That's that love never failing type of thinking. When you see again that just little simple artwork up there in the Bible verse around it, charity never faileth. You say, okay, I can grab a hold of that. Well, let me remind you of our title last week. We must warn the world. Have you been warning the world this week? Have you warned the world that their love is going to fail, but God's love never fails? Have you been warning them that their wisdom is going to fail, but God's wisdom does not fail? Are you warning them that the spirit of this world is contrary to God's spirit, and that God is saying that that stuff is going to fail, but I will not fail? Even it says in, in 1 Corinthians 1, and, and this is just part of our introduction, I'm going to Proverbs here in a minute, it says, God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things of the mighty, and the base things of the world, the things which are despised, had God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, because it's about the glory of God. It's always been that. Do we realize that this world's wisdom wants to take the, the glory away from God? Do we know how deep the riches of God's wisdom are versus the just surfacey wisdom of this world? The world's wisdom is simply trapped. Its ceiling is about this high. You may get some great knowledge and stuff, and even we know in just getting the definition from Noah Webster's dictionary, it is the right use or exercise of knowledge. So wisdom in general, very simply, is the choice of laudable ends and the best means to accomplish them. It is simply that. It's wisdom in act or effect or practice. If wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the mind, it's the faculty of discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful. That's just a dictionary definition of wisdom. But it says in Strong's Concordance, and this is the New Testament place, G4678 says, Wisdom is broad and full of intelligence, used of the knowledge of the very diverse manners. Of course, if you looked at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, very simply, it's teaching you that the preaching of the cross is to them that per, uh, perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. The world's going... The natural man is going, the, the, the spirit of this world is going, Pa! that's a baloney. You need to save yourself. But when I look at Strong's definition, it goes far enough with scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture where you say, wow, it is God's supreme intelligence. And it is found in his purpose and his plan. It's in his provision, his providence, his promise. This is God and his wisdom. And he says in his scriptures, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has God not made the foolish, made foolish the wisdom of this world? Okay. So when you think on that, you think of the definition of wisdom, and that's where our last couple of messages have been. And this is our kickoff to our, our study. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. Let me just simply state this for you. The spirit of the natural man, it, the spirit of the natural man, the lost person, the unregenerated natural man. Remember when you were lost? Some of you were lost until a few years into your life. Some of you get saved at a younger age, so maybe this is not as strong in your life. But the spirit of the natural man does not receive wisdom. And the spirit of the world completely rejects wisdom, the wisdom of God. They really do. Why? Why would they not say, this world's messed up? 
the way that the world is going about their wisdom doesn't make any sense. What we're teaching young people or we're teaching others, half of it makes sense, half of it doesn't. Is it really common sense that we're to follow? As I preached a number of maybe months ago, a year or two ago, even in our, I think in our Ecclesiastes study, God's sense makes sense to God. But common sense is not always God's sense. This world says, ah, I can figure it out on my own. I've got this. I'll figure it out. Well, here's Proverbs chapter number one. Pick it up with me in verse number 20, and maybe we can answer the question, why? Let the scriptures give us the answer. I like it that way. Verse 20, Proverbs 1. I'm reading this a couple days ago. I'm preparing it. Oh, my goodness, what a reminder of where the world is at. This is God speaking through the writer Solomon. Wisdom crieth out. She uttereth her voice in the streets, verse 21. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye have re- ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Think of it. This is God speaking in the wisdom and the context of what wisdom is doing. Wisdom is crying out. God is crying out. Verse 26. He says, in the midst of you, refusing my reproof of not regarding what I'm saying in wisdom, of wisdom crying out with counsel, you don't want any of my reproof? I'm trying to show you, you're going down the wrong path. It's destruction. God says, I, will, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they, excuse me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Wisdom is crying out. The spirit of the living God in the Old Testament is crying out through the written word of God by the speaker Solomon saying, I'm crying out to you, world. And you say, nope, 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 nope. Why? Why? Why is man like this? Why are we like this? He says in verse number 31, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. There it is. And be filled with their own devices. There it is. For the turning of the simple shall slay them. And the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Think about that. In the Old Testament, as you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, the teaching about wisdom is throughout the word of God. And Paul is speaking right off the bat to the church at Corinth, planted at 52-ish A.D., that this letter is written in 56-ish A.D., and within four years, they're in such a calamity, in such a mess. How did it happen to the believers? Did they possibly return back to the ways of the natural man, even though they're converted and regenerated? Is it possible, as I've said over the last couple, two or three weeks, that the church, the believers in the church, the body of Christ, can slip back into that place? I can be self-sufficient. I don't want to trouble God with my problems. I can be self-righteous. I can be self-educated. What can the Word of God really do for me? I can be self-improved, I can be self-made, I can just be self. Why? How is it? 
Because when you look up at a simple statement of love never fails, that charity never faileth, that as we look at this whole study, an encapsulation of 16 chapters, people will go to the place where they'll look for love in all the wrong places. They will look for the solution to life in so many places. They will listen to the noise of this world and the wisdom of this world and the spirit of this world. And God's saying, I put all of my wisdom before you and, you tur- and I want you to turn at my reproof. I called upon you, you refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded it. That's what the church of Corinth did. After being converted and having the Spirit of God and forgetting that the Spirit of God within them as believers in the church, that's the one that's going to teach them the things of God. Not their spirit, back to the spirit of that Corinth, heavy metropolitan city area filled with false gods, sin upon sin, money-making stuff. They were just, that city would be regarded just as the cities of the day. It was even stronger and more powerful than Athens at the time of the writing and, the, and how this church plant happened. God sent Paul to the tough places. Rome, Thessalonica, the churches of Macedonia. God said, go to those rough, tough places. I want you to plant the good news of Jesus Christ, and I want a church to be started there. And Paul went after the tough stuff. And he kept on coming back for more. And he kept on writing the letters. And he kept on by the Spirit of God saying, you need God's wisdom. You need to grab a handle of God's wisdom. This world has got you and I all thinking that everything's just going to be okay. Well, we're born again, everything. Yeah. And if all you think about is yourself, self-sufficiency then you and I will not warn the world that their wisdom is foolishness and it'll take them right to hell and God forbid if we have gotten to the place that the church at Corinth has gotten where they were more concerned on what Bible teacher they were following what doctrine that they could concoct that was alteration and perversion of God's doctrine? If we today consider that this could happen to a church that was thriving with Apostle Paul in presence as the leader for 18 months, then how about us? Today as we look at our message in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 16. I want you to think this through for a moment. We as believers have the Holy Spirit in us. We as believers in the church have the Holy Spirit to teach us the Word of God. And as you see here up on the title, there are Holy Spirit things that are in this text that we really need to just be reminded of. Maybe for the first time, take the lesson that God's showing us through Paul the Apostle's writing in the Spirit of God. How do you come with with Holy Spirit things? Well, verse number, excuse me, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way down through 14, 15, mentions the word things. Things, things, more things, things. There's things everywhere, and these are Holy Spirit things. And this morning, as you even remember, I was just reading 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 a little bit about how God chose the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, the base things of the world, the things of the world God said, hey, I can use against them to alert them to the things of me, the Holy Spirit things. So as chapter number two gets going a little bit more, and we covered the first eight verses last week, here we are in verses nine through 16 going, okay, what are these Holy Spirit things that we need to hold on to? Because God's way is the way that we want to go. At least I heard that. And Paul is contrasting 
the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. He's looking at the spirit of God versus the spirit of this world. He's looking at the man of God versus the spirit, or excuse me, the man of this world. And I think to myself again this morning how easily we can lose track and how we need to look at the scriptures and say, whoa, I know why. Because man has a way of just simply rejecting God because he thinks he's got it together better than God. Believers, you know better than that today. Church, you know better than that today. And today I want us to look at this passage of scripture. We're going to read it through here and say, okay, what are these Holy Spirit things that we can learn from? Chapter number 2, verse number 9. Let's read our passage of scripture. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. What's the them? It was in verse number 9, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. For the spirit, verse number 10 continues, searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. So here we are, the things which God hath prepared, verse 9. Verse number 10, the deep things of God. Let's continue, verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Very simply put, how do you know things about being a man a woman, a person, and not an animal, a bird, a fish. Because you are a human. You know the things that make you up. You know what it's like to be a person. Not an alien from Mars. Are some of you aliens? None of you are laughing. I'm concerned. There might be a problem here. You are born of God. You are God's creation. When you're born again, you are now a new creature, a new creation. And you're in Christ, and so you're regenerated. You're brand new. He's saying, what man know the things of man? Say, hey, you should know about yourself. You know that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? A regenerated person doesn't have to live there, but that's the lost person. And when you get a new heart and a new life, you say, well, I don't want to go back to that. Sometimes we slip back into but he continues in verse number 12 and says this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Everybody likes free, don't you? Your salvation is free. That's what he's speaking of. Think of in your salvation, though, how much other stuff you got. Because we like stuff. Things, you know. We, we like stuff. You have a home waiting for you in your salvation. That was a free gift. You have a new family. Other brothers and sisters in the Lord. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You have the ability to know the Word of God because of the Spirit of God. The gifts keep on giving. We'll get to there in a minute because that's one of our lessons today. What a free gift we have in Jesus Christ. What a friend we have in Jesus. I won't sing anymore. Don't want to lose the audience. Verse 13, stay with your strength. Here's the Word of God continues 13 through 16. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Two different kinds of words they teach, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. There's the things again. Verse 14, for the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit things. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, for the next few minutes, I'd like to really just 
show you some lessons from this passage. We've had a little introduction. We've talked to some things. If you would, bow your heads for a minute. Let's pray. Because this passage has really got a lot of strong stuff in it. I just really want God to lead us in our study. Father, again, we've been praying a little bit, and we've been singing a little bit, and we've been reading your word, and we've already spoken about some, some principles already. And so, God, you've been in the midst of all this already. In the name of Jesus, we really want you to grab our attention. Shake us to the core a bit by your Holy Spirit's power of teaching and reproving and doing work that only he can do. I pray that, Father, in the name of Jesus, that your power, your great grace, your great power will work on us. We will come out of this realizing that the wisdom of this world is really messed up. And we have to warn the world that the wisdom of God is in Jesus. And we need to get on point. We need to get focused, repurposed in what our calling must be as the New Testament church. Thank you for the words in Corinthians letters. Boy, they're strong. And I pray you'd work a work in my life, all of our lives personally, and work a work in us collectively. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There is some lessons here in this love never fails study in chapter number two as we think about Holy Spirit things. There are some things that, again, the word things is mentioned a lot. And, and so, again, you go, ah, just things, and they're just things. These are spirit things. These are spiritual matters and things. And when it's all really kind of, and I've mentioned it a bit, but when it comes down to it, and everything really is looked at and examined, <sighs> the lost man, the natural man, does not know the things of God. And the man of God, the woman of God, the born-again person of God, knows the things of God. So why is it that we walk around with such ignorance sometimes? How is that as believers we do not avail ourselves to the Word of God? I heard this recently from another preacher. I'm going to borrow it. Borrowing stuff's okay, right? You can, I may not be giving it back. I don't know if it works, but no. Just the Spirit of God did bring it to my memory. You've come here this morning, and I'm going to preach and teach the Word of God. Do you expect me to be prepared? Do you expect me to be prepared? What if I told you I spent five minutes preparing the message? What would you think? You wouldn't be too happy with me, would you? What kind of guy are you? What kind of man of God are you? May I then submit to you, is it fair enough to say that I should expect you to come prepare to hear what God has to say? Is that, is that proper? When you come to the Word of God and say, God, teach me, does not God have the right to say, are you ready to learn? Are you prepared to hear from me? Today I wonder, as the days march on, that the buzzing noise of this world that goes with a bunch of things that are not Holy Spirit things, that we have a better attentiveness to the things of this world than the things that are in his word. That the wisdom of this world is overtaking us too much, and we need to just break free out of it. We really do. How do you do it? You need more of him and less of that. It's just simple. How did you figure that out? Well, I read what John said to Jesus when he was approaching him in John chapter 3. John the baptizer. I must decrease and you must increase. He was regarded as the prophet of all time by Jesus, who then said, those that believe on me are even greater than he. It's in your Bible. If John the Baptist, who was the ushering in prophet, crying in the wilderness of Jesus is, com Jesus is coming, the light of the world, he's coming. And yet he had to decrease. Are any of you ready to be John the Baptist? Paul the Apostle? I just need to be who God wants me to be by the Spirit of the living God, by his word. 
He wants me to be like Jesus Christ. He wants you to be like Jesus Christ. He wants to conform you to his image. And when I open up the word of God and I see that there's Holy Spirit things that are found in this letter to the Corinthian church, and it was written almost 2,000 years ago, I'm going, wow, how did you know that it was going to be like this now? Because God knows us. Go back and read the proverb of the day. But what will I do to respond to it? Because I'm born again. I've been born again for almost 39 years. What have I done with that responsibility? Have I allowed God to hold me accountable for all that he has given to me and taught me? How about you? You have a Bible on your lap. If you don't have one, come ask me. I got some. I'll give them away to you. I have a, somewhat, I have a good friend that gives me Bibles all the time. He finds them and they're all new. <laughs> this haven't been used or nobody's bought it. What? I got Bibles if you need Bibles. How is it that we're so short on God's wisdom? I'm not talking about being the smartest person in the room. I'm talking about godly wisdom. I hath not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. So my first lesson here today is this. God reveals himself by his love as the Holy Spirit searches things. Where did I find that? I found it in the Bible and the Holy Spirit had me put it down there for you. Verses 9 and 10. Well, verse number 10, as I mentioned earlier, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. What has he revealed? The things which God has prepared for them that love him. It's in the Bible. He has so much for you. He has so much for us. Well, what does that mean? Well, better job, more money in my account, a newer house. How about I have a depth of love for you that you don't even know? The Father gave his son. I want you to know that love, and I want you to take that love, and I want you to live in that love so that you can give that love to someone else. How is it? That's God's wisdom. That's God's wisdom I have not seen nor you heard. I know that it's a quote out of Isaiah chapter 64, but that's of them thinking of, I know, eternity. But he's, Paul, quoting it for a personal application in the moment in 56, 57, 58 AD. Hey, church at Corinth, do you have any idea how much God has for you? Because he says in verse number 10, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Spirit will search him. Oh, I need to go find deep things. Shame on you that you think you can find them. Shame on me to think that I could find them. You know who's going to search the deep things? The Holy Spirit. So I have to let him do so. Oh, I was just walking around and God gave me a great thought, and I think it's a pretty great spiritual deep thought. Whoa, 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 whoa. How about the deep things that he searches out that he gives to you as a gift? We'll get to that in a minute. You think he gives them to you? He's the one who searches them out and says, here, let me have you understand it simply. God reveals himself by his love as the Holy Spirit searches things. Think about Romans chapter number one. I got a few Romans references today. Because I'm doing a little study on that book right now with someone. So it just happens to be fresh in my heart and my mind. And so God was just, if it says it in there and it says it in here, I'm going, my goodness, this is good. We know, you know the verses in Romans chapter number 1, verse 15, 16. I, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul's speaking, it's the power of God. He says in verse number 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who shall who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hey, Verse number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Any of you that have read Romans, he's saying, I manifest it, I show it, and I reveal to you it. What is it? The wisdom of me and the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world is that man is unrighteous and they're damned to hell because they rejected me and they're lost in their own sin. The righteousness of me that I am giving to you is the good news of the gospel. I'm manifesting it to you. I make it known to you. That's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 
eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. What has he got for them that love him? The things that God says in verse number 10, I've revealed them unto us by his spirit. But if you as a believer do not engage the word of God, and don't ask the spirit of God to teach you, and you're constantly going to another man and another woman and another person, that's fine. Hopefully it's in the spirit. But when are you and I going to spend a little bit more time alone with God? And let God teach us by his spirit the same things that he taught Apostle Paul. Well, I'm not Paul. You don't have to be Paul. You can just be Sam, Bill, Judith, Joanne. You can be any of those people, and you can learn the word of God. And that's what God's saying is, I will, in my power, reveal myself by my love. That's the love that it says in verse number 9. And that the Spirit will do the searching. Bam! Bam! That's so simple. We just read the word of God. We drew just a simple summation out of it for us 21st century know-it-alls, me included. Like, I think I know something. This is God's word that's timeless. And it speaks to me. Ha, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's it. What has he revealed? Man's unrighteousness. <laughs> Man's ungodliness. He's revealed his righteousness from faith to faith. And he has said, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The second lesson is very simple up there as well. Verses number 11 and 12. God indwells believers by his gift, the gift of Jesus. And then, like I said, this supplemental powerful gift, the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit gives things. Verses number 11 and 12, look at them again. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? I can know about who I am. I know the person that I am. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. An unsaved, lost, unregenerated person does not know the things of God. But here you are, born again today, and you can. You already know things of God. And you're maybe in Salvation 101. I've been saved for a little while. I've been born again. I've read the Bible a little bit. I've heard a little few Bible lessons. Fine. So you know that you're redeemed? You know that you're forgiven? That's a pretty good deal. Do you know it's by grace that you continue to go? Yes. Do you know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for Yes, but I choose not to do anything about it. Okay. We sung a song that had in it, there's an army rising up. Where's the army? I'm, I'm with you here. We're the army. It's a scary thought. How many of you have dug in really hard this past week to warn the world that their wisdom is an absolute mess and they're going to go to hell on their own wisdom? How many of us did that? We're, we're just a, a little bump on the hill in Blue Springs here, but there's thousands of people. You intersect with different people all day long. I referenced Romans chapter number 5 up here. You know the passage, some of you. By the way, there's some good stuff in Romans about the Spirit of God. We know this. In Romans chapter number 5, verse number 15, we pick it up, but not as offense, so also as the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more than the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, that abounded unto many. That's what he's saying over here. This gift, this free gift, this gift that comes in salvation in Jesus, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Here we are reading it in Romans chapter number 5. It says up there in verse number 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the one free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. This world does not comprehend that at all. But when you start showing that to someone who's lost, I remember someone explaining that to me. They said very simply, Mark, you're in that package of people that are condemned by your sin already. And that very simply, Jesus' obedience to the work that he did. Oh, I know all about that. I know the death, burial, resurrection. Have you ever, ever applied it to your own life and called on the name of the Lord to save you and trusted in his finished work instead of his work plus a bunch of your work? His work plus maybe my list of qualifications to be self-righteous. Paul's teaching the church at Corinth. Paul's teaching the people of Rome and the Roman church, the lost people that are in Rome, the whole conglomeration of people. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 5, 21. Jesus is our free gift, and it opens up the floodgate for gifts upon gifts upon gifts from the Holy Spirit of God giving you a gift and another gift and another gift and another gift. He's at work in you and you have missed it so much, don't miss it anymore. Let the word of God dwell in you richly and allow his word to bring alive the presence and power of the Holy Spirit of God in you. He searches all things, the Bible says. He knows all things. Man only knows of himself until he's saved and he's regenerated. Then he opens up the word of God and the spirit of God teaches him about the things of God. That's how you know things of God. Stop taking so much credit for things that have nothing to do with you and your own self-righteousness. It's God that does it. It is him. These are the Holy Spirit things. Your third lesson comes out of verse number 13. God gives wisdom by the words as the Holy Spirit teaches things. Watch this, verse 13. Let's read it real slow. Watch this. Which things also we speak, comma, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Man has lots of words. So man uses lots of words. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual I didn't say the world's spiritualism, spiritual things of God, the things that don't make any sense to the world. God gives wisdom by his words as the Holy Spirit teaches things. He's saying the words of man, and there's lots, teach something totally different. It's man's wisdom. The Holy Spirit, maybe with a small, still voice, Maybe with some resounding clap of thunder, the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom by his words, and that's what he's doing to teach you. He's constantly teaching us. Are we responsive to his teaching? Well, if I don't open the Bible up, then I don't have to really be responsive to anything but me. But if I open up the word of God and I say, God, will you please show me things? I know the spirit of the living God's in me because I'm born again. Now, Teach me. May I submit to you maybe at this moment that you're really truly not the temple of the Holy Ghost because you're truly not saved. Maybe that's the issue. I open up the Bible, I don't understand a thing. I've been saved supposedly for five or 10 or 15 years. I'm not talking about not being able to read. I'm not talking about a reading disability or incapability. But do you have a Bible? I don't talk about electric ones. No, they're fine. That's okay. Digital stuff. That's okay. But what about if you just had a Bible and you put it on your lap or you put it on a table or you just sat down at it? And you grabbed a little spiral notebook and you started saying, God, teach me. I'm going to start reading 1 Corinthians because that's where the pastor is teaching. I'm going to read the book of Romans. He seemed to cite that today. Maybe I'll read the proverb of the day because there's 31 proverbs and there's 31 days in a month. Just maybe. Well, after two, three, four, five, six, seven months, you're reading the Bible, you're attempting to read the Bible, you're getting nothing out of it. May I submit to you there might be something not quite right there. Because I'm just quoting the Bible. 
The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit until they're converted and regenerated by that gift, and then you start receiving. It doesn't mean you're going to understand every single word of God in prophecy or everything God taught in the Old and New Testament tomorrow, but you will learn and grow and the Word of God will start working on you and the Spirit's teaching you. You know what I'm talking about. All of you that know what I'm talking about, just do this. All of you that don't know what I'm talking about, please search your heart. If you're wondering, there's some pastors here that would love to sit down and talk to you. If it's just a matter of a dry and thirsty land in your life right now, that's fine. But if there's no desire for the Word of God, maybe it's time to have a serious talk with God. That's what Paul's telling us in this letter here. It says in Romans chapter number 8, so much about the Spirit of God, I'll just read these two verses. They apply very simply here. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's a lost person. If ye through the Spirit of do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you are also too born again and you start living after the flesh, God may take your physical life. Nothing further to be said. We somehow have got to have a serious talk with ourselves before we have a serious talk with God. And maybe we, me, I've had these talks with God. It's more than just search my heart. It's deeper than that. God reveal. And maybe it's time to just go through Psalm 51, every one of us. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. Maybe, just maybe. I finish with this last lesson. Very simply this, God changes by the mind of Christ as the Holy Spirit discerns things. He changes us by the mind of Christ. It's in the scriptures, verse 14, 15, 16. It's very simple, straightforward. The natural man, I said this earlier, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness unto him. The natural man says, that stuff about God is foolishness. It doesn't make any sense. I don't believe in it. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone. Then there's the person that's the natural man that's desiring to be converted. They're looking for answers in life. And they start saying, please teach me God. Please teach me God. I don't know what to do. I am lost. I'm like a, I'm like a ship out in the middle of an ocean and there's a hurricane and I don't know what to do. Please. So they're not even advancing to the place of the mind of Christ. They just want to know that there's a different way of life. God, I'm helpless, I'm broken, and I need to be saved. I am lost, I am broken, and I need salvation. But this is for the believer. The believer is being put to task and to test by the Holy Spirit, by Paul the Apostle. Because, very simply this, for they are foolishness unto him, the natural man, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But when you're saved, verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Very simply this. When you were lost, you couldn't tell whether you were saved or lost because you had to have a clue. When you got saved, you could actually go, whoa, now I know that things are bad and things are good. That's how you judge all things. Oh my goodness, I've got friends that are going to hell. They're lost because now I'm saved. And I go, oh my, oh, wow. The lights start going off. There. Bam, 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 bam. Because you never knew that on the other side of, etern of, there, of there's an eternal life and there's salvation and there's a spirit of God inside of you. You go, whew. Now you've got this passion to go tell people that you have this new life and you can judge things and say, you need Jesus. Before you didn't know that anybody knew Jesus because you were on the same side. There was no spiritual discernment either way. But when you're saved, now you're able to be spiritually discerning. Take that simple message to the world, because it says in verse number 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. Are you, you, you think you can instruct the Lord? But he says, but we have the mind of Christ. Oh, the mind of Christ. It's limitless. 
The natural man does not understand the Christian. They live in two different worlds, but the Christian, however, understands the lost man, the lost ungenerated, unregenerated man, the lost man, the natural man. Now that you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. You go, oh, ah, that's how you know. It says in Romans 11, 33, 34. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who, who hath first given to him? And it shall be him recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the mind of Christ. That's where you sit as a born-again believer. And if you are saved five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, he has given you this spiritually discerning ability to look at a lost person and go, you need Jesus. When you were lost, did you ever do that? I have yet to meet a lost person who said, I need to witness to you because you need to be saved. (laughs) Because they're not spiritually discerning. For the world, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. He reproves the natural man. As found in John chapter number 16, as Jesus Christ said, when I send you this comforter, if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit does for the lost, the world. You know what he does for us? The church, you and I, the Holy Spirit brings things of God to us. So simply, in our invitation, what did he bring to you? What did the Spirit of God bring to you today? Did he bring you a burden? Good. Did he bring you something that you need to deal with? Good. He's brought me an awful lot today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we enter a very precious time, and we know this is an invitation time, We've all been invited by you, God, in the name of Jesus. And because of Jesus to salvation. We've also been invited to give the good news. We've also been invited by your word as regenerated, born-again believers that have the Spirit of God in us to open the word of God and learn your wisdom. Maybe today you've spoken to someone that's lost, someone that's saved. I'm sure you've been speaking to all of us as you spoken to me personally. I pray in this invitation time, please God, my Father, in Jesus, by your Spirit, work.